Cool. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, coming along to uh, hear me waffle on a little bit about fake and packet. And uh, yeah, that's kind of really what I'm gonna talk about. And um, just kind of go through, you know, why you might want to use fake and packet together. You know, why not use NuGet? You know, why not use Sake or, you know, or C C Make or Make or you know Rake or any of those things? And you know, just sort of give you some examples of why these are these are kind of good tools to uh, to go through. So yeah, a little bit about me, very very quickly. So a software engineer at Elastic, so the company behind Elasticsearch, Logstash, Gabbana, Beats, and a few other things. Um, so I mainly work on the .NET side of things or the Microsoft side of things, so .NET clients, uh, the Zero Marketplace stuff, the ARM templates. Uh, we've got some MSI installers coming out as well woo, to make that uh, experience easier for Windows and a bit more native for Windows. Uh, and I'm sort of interested in these things, so come say hi to us. So in the days before NuGet, Everyone had a libs folder or lib folder or you know bin two folder or some some folder within their within their solution, right? And uh, yeah, oh, I've st you've still got that, have you? dude. You've come to the right talk then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know you would go and scour the internet. You know you'd find like oh, you know I'm looking for an Hibernate and I'm looking for an Hibernate two four one and uh, you know you'd go and hunt it down. It'd be on SourceForge probably and. Uh, you know, you download it there and you drop it into the lib folder and then you set up the reference and, you know, happy days. But, you know, you'd have to make sure that there was binary compatibility between all of those different assemblies. So that if they had, if there were transitive de dependencies between one package and another one, you need to make sure that, you know, putting in some, maybe some assembly redirects, you could be able to sort of massage the two together and make them work together or otherwise go to the source, compile it yourself against the, you know, a known version of that conflicting dependency and then, you know, drop that into your lib folder. So that was kind of how things were not even that long ago, right? It was like 2010, 20, 2009 maybe? 2000, I, I forget now. It was around, around that sort of time. And then sort of new get made referencing a breeze, you know, we sort of suddenly we've got this this GUI inside of Visual Studio and we got a NuGet.exe and we could go and find the packages and we had the versions of them and that was all awesome and uh, you know it was we were in a much, much happier place. Um, the only kind of problem was is that like NuGet was NuGet hell was kind of the new DLL hell. You know, you still had the same kind of problems that you had with having that libs folder and sort of transitive dependencies between things and you know having to maybe go and recompile stuff against another known version so it was kind of kind of the same kind of deal and pl plenty of people have written about the problems uh, they've, they've had with NuGet there um, so the first thing I want to talk about is packet so what is packet it's dependency manager for dotnet and mono so a hey, cross-platform which is the new uh, you know that's the new 2016 uh, Microsoft. So yeah, it's designed to w work well with NuGet packages, enables referencing files directly from Git repositories, so ideal for working with F Sharp, so F Sharp script up on GitHub somewhere, you can reference that directly with Packet, uh, or any HTTP resource, and it gives you precise and predictable control, and I'll go over a few of the reasons why you might want to use Packet over, say, uh, NuGet. Uh, but it, it sort of gives you better understanding exactly of what, you know, what projects within your application are using what dependencies as well. So there are kind of a few main components to it. So I'm going to go through uh, what each of these are. But essentially Packet XE is the actual executable that runs and does all the packet -y stuff. Uh, packet dependencies, uh, packet lock, and packet references. So packet.exe, uh, you, you generally find it within... So if you've installed packet in a, into a solution, you'll generally find it in the .packet directory. And uh, you, know, you can sort of run it with the help command and you'll get a list of all of the various different commands that you can run with packet there. So these are kind of the, the common ones here. Uh, ignore the syntax highlighting. Uh, for some reason, reveal.js just uh, you know, likes some of those words more than others. Um, 
but yeah, you can sort of get a, a list of all of the different commands there. So things like adding a new package, finding references, uh, creating an empty packet dependencies, yeah, installing, finding outdated ones. And there's a new command as well that came in recently, which I'll, t I'll talk about in a little bit. So next thing was, is packet dependencies. So this goes in your solution route, and this is basically, uh, this is like your master kind of view of all of the as assemblies or packages, NuGet packages or scripts that you're, you're referencing within your entire solution. So just kind of going, going down it here a little bit. So you specify a source. So this one's using the, the version two NuGet API, and then we're pulling JSON.NET from there. And then we're using this version three API of NuGet, and we're bringing in ASCII.NET uh, NuGet package from there. And then we've got this group here, uh, which I'll talk about what groups are in a little bit. But basically, we've got, again, here, another source for this group. And we've got fake, F-sharp data, git link as well, which I'll talk about in a little bit as well. And then we've got another source here coming from myget. And we've got this uh, pre-release runner of the unit, X unit runner here. Um, anyone got any ideas why we might still have that in there? So as some background, the .NET, uh, .NET clients for Elasticsearch uh, run on Core CLR. So uh, they run on desktop CLR, but they also run on Core CLR as well. So uh, at that time, all of our tests are written in XUnit, and there was no XUnit compatible version of Core CLR. There was one up on MyGet, so hence, hence why we've got that one in there. So you run a packet install, so you've got your packet XE, you've got your packet dependencies file, then you run a packet install, and packet will generate this uh, packet lock file. This is kind of similar to like the project JSON lock file that you, you, you know, you're probably familiar with if you've been playing with the, the newer tooling. But yeah, this is basically the global lock file here. So you can see essentially uh, these are kind of the top level dependencies here. And then you can see sort of the, the, their, sub, their transitive dependencies there as well. So that kind of just uh, kind of gives you like the global view of what you see at the solution level. Uh, then what you would see in each one of your particular projects is this packet references file. And then this basically specify, you specify here w w uh, which packages are needed by each every single project essentially so you have a packet dot references in the in the root of every project like next to the cs proj or the fs proj or the x proj which i think is going away but um you'll see this in there so you can easily see uh, which packages are there and you can you can also specify versions as well so that was kind of like a brief overview of what packet is and kind of you know, the tooling there and kind of the main components of it. Why would you want to use Packet over NuGet? You know, I mean, I, lo I love my GUIs as much as the next guy, I also like the command line, but, um, you know, why would you use this over, over NuGet? So kind of going back over a few of the points I made at the beginning, one of the reasons is predictable control over your references. Like, can anyone look at this and tell me what are the main dependencies of this project? Like, .NET 4? Yeah, 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 .NET, yeah, .NET 4, yeah, that's the framework, certainly. But you have no idea, looking at this, which of these are, are packages that are referenced in the project and which ones are transitive, i.e. referenced by other packages. You've got no idea looking at that. The other thing here is that like, the version numbers here for all of these packages, they're burnt into the, into the package file. So kind of NuGet makes no separation for transitive dependencies. And then upgrading packages globally across projects can be really painful when you have this in every single project. And then you go, you know, you go click on the solution and you, you get, uh, manage new get packages for solution and then having to work your way down through all of the myriad of checkboxes on there. I, I, I get, I'll be honest, I get confused with that. I, I totally get confused with that. And I'm sure it's done stuff that has been unexpected for me by clicking various different combinations there. So this is the same thing that we saw here, but with Packet. I know straight away that this project here references only Nest 
and only net topology suite IO JSON. Everything else there, everything else here is a transitive dependency. So that's, that's kind of cool. The second thing is referencing multiple sources. Okay, NuGet, NuGet can do that as well. So you can pull from NuGet if you want to and all the different versions of NuGet. Also pull from MyGet as well, which um, we saw an example of there with the XUnit runner. You can also reference stuff directly on GitHub as well. So as I said before, if you're using F Sharp and F Sharp scripts, then you can just pull those down and reference those directly and then you know, um, if they change, you know, you can pull down the updated versions. So if you're, if you're kind of, uh, you might be toying with some ideas and have like a few F sharp scripts up in gists and that you can reference those easily in packet and, and pull those down. But you can also use your own NuGet server as well for anyone um, brave enough or, or, you know, needs to run their own NuGet server internally, you know, maybe your company's locked down in some way then you can also use packet for that as well, and essentially any HTTP resource. Uh, one of the other reasons, or another reason for using packet, having multiple versions of the same dependency is extremely easy to see. You know, for example, here we've got New uh, newtonsoft.json is kind of our main, uh, so json.net will be using the latest one here by default because we haven't specified a, a version number there. But then, you know, let's say we've got like a .NET 4 project that we still need to support in some way, which uh, we did up until version one of the .NET client. I have a version uh, .NET 4 version of the client that we also needed to build. Um, and that might be using a different version of JSON.NET, for example, or you might, you might have these like, uh, like auxiliary projects uh, in your solution that do other stuff that aren't maybe, they're not part of something that you've released, but they might be, uh, for example, like used to generate code or used to generate documentation or used for like your build process. And you might want to reference like a different version for those as well. So a group basically allows you to do that. So with, within a group, what you'd see is in the packages folder. So packet puts everything in a packages folder as well. What you'll see in that packages folder, you'll have another uh, uh, directory in there with the name of your group and then inside of that directory there you'll have all of your packages specified underneath that group. So really easy to see what's going on there. Different framework versions. Now this is something that I, I think this is one of the best things in uh, Packet to be honest. Um, you know how many of us have kind of I, I know I've done it I did it the other day I was messing around with the project but um, you'll sort of build something and you'll start a new project and you'll start writing something out and you know it, it, you might have .NET 452 as your default framework and you've gone all the way through and you've added all your dependencies with NuGet and then uh, or, or .NET 6 let's say and then now suddenly you've realized oh, actually I needed to be building this for another framework version so you change the framework version of all of the projects and then you get all of the warnings from NuGet now saying that you know you're referencing a version of the uh, of that package which is built for a different framework version I, I mean I, I've seen that quite a few times what packet does which is really neat is it leverages uh, some of the MS build configuration and uh, so when you when you reference a package here it actually puts this uh, conditional uh, statement within the within the CS proj or FS proj uh, to basically reference different versions of the package uh, depending on which version of the framework you know which version of the framework you're targeting so you know you don't have to worry anymore about that you know I've referenced this version now I need to change the framework version so super super helpful this is also helpful as well if you build stuff which i go into in a little bit if you build stuff on the command line and you target different framework versions there as well so for example for the dotnet client we actually build three different versions of it a dotnet 4.5 a dotnet 6 and a net standard 1.3 version the core clr version and this is super, super helpful for doing that. We basically just run MS build with different commands or .NET XE with different commands, uh, different framework versions, and we get, you know, we, we get the, uh, the, the right output out there that we want. Another super, super cool feature, flagging delisted packages. So 
I've referenced my, you know, I've referenced this left pad package <laughs> up, 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 yeah, up on NuGet, I've, you know, and, and it's beautiful. I'm using it all over the place, and um, you know, this 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 fellow or, or, or lady has provided it for me, and I'm like, yeah, that's awesome. I'm using it left, right, and center because you know, left left pad is awesome. You know, there's someone, someone else has got a right pad package as well that I'm also using just in case. Um, but now they, they've had a dispute and they've decided they're gonna essentially delete that package from NuGet. So NuGet doesn't allow you to do that, only allows you to delist it, but sort of roll with me here a little bit. So I'm using this package. Next time I go to run and build my project, Packet tells me about that. You know, the owner of that package, left pad one alpha has unlisted that package could mean that it's deprecated and shouldn't be used anymore. So Packet tells me this, as, you know, when I, when I build, every single time I build, which has definitely come up when we've been building the clients. All of the system reactive, all the reactive RX uh, packages, they all went through a rename uh, a few months ago, and we were using the current version at that time, and then now I can't remember exactly what they're called now, system.reactive something or other. Um, but we got flagged that all of those had been deprecated and then we could easily reference the new ones. It was just a case then of just going to the net and finding out what, they, what they're called now instead. So as I said sort of previously and as I started with, giving you a global view of your uh, dependencies. So what, you know, where's this package used? What's it used by? Is it a dependency of another package? And um, recently, uh, Stefan uh, or Stephen Stefan uh, added uh, the packet Y command here. So basically, you can issue this and figure out. It'll tell you exactly whether it's a direct dependency or whether it's a, you know a dependency referenced by another package. Um, this is kind of a short example here, but um, I did have one. You try this in your own projects for something like you know System Component Model or something like that. And, uh, or even one of the new net standard packages and see all of the stuff that comes up for that. You know, it's like a massive long list. Um, but yeah, you can sort of unlock the details of those complex dependency chains with, with this command, which I think is cool. So that was kind of like an overview of like why you should use Packet, kind of going on a bit further. Um, it's probably good to talk about how package resolution happens in Packet and then look at how that compares to NuGet and you sort of decide on, you know, wh which one sounds like a reasonable strategy to you. So the way that the package re uh, resolution or dependency resolution goes in uh, packet here is basically select the latest version for each of the packages in the dependencies file, plus all their transitive dependencies, and then such that all the version constraints are satisfied. And it does, it takes a, so I mean, this is a well-known problem. It's a, a link there, constraint satisfaction problem, kind of similar to like a specification problem. And it has a few different strategies that it goes about uh, trying to find those dependencies. So it's, so it's kind of, the easiest thing to, is probably to go and look at the code for how it does it, but it kind of does a breadth first approach so it doesn't, you know, crawl down and figure out this thing. It does a breadth-first approach. Um, it sorts them based on requirements, based on whether there are conflicts that it finds. It will provide some boosting to those particular packages to say, hey, I need to pay more detail to uh, solving a particular uh, conflict with this one than I do other packages. Um, and then, yeah, so it sort of gives those ones that potentially conflict will boost. And if it can't resolve, you know, problems for, uh, across all of those packages, then it will tell you about that as well. It won't just silently go, hey, everything's okay. It will, it will tell you about that. So the way that if we sort of contrast this with how NuGet does its dependency resolution, um, it kind of depends on what version of NuGet you're using, to be honest. Um, so if different people have different NuGet exes, uh, you know, with, uh, running on their local machines, it could do very different things. So in NuGet uh, 2.7 and previous, it would basically use the highest patched version of a particular uh, package. It would use that. That was changed in NuGet 2.8, which now used the lowest patch version. So 
can anyone remember that change coming in? Because I, I certainly can, you know, it's like, I'll pick the lowest dependency by default. I think it was like a couple of years ago, I think maybe a year ago. It doesn't seem that long ago, but then I'm getting older, so. Um, <laughs> But yeah, it picks the lowest patch version. And then now, in so this is that's 2.7 and 2.8. Now in NuGet 3, there's another way it does uh, resolution. So there's a few, a few strategies that it goes through for that. One is that it looks at the lowest applicable version, like in 2.8. But then it looks at floating versions as well. And then it looks at nearest winds. And then it looks at cousin dependencies. So if they're at the equal depth within the package dependencies, uh, then it will look at the lowest version of that one that satisfies the overall ones. I mean, you can imagine that's quite a, a complicated process to go through. Um, but yeah, so there's a kind of a few different strategies there. Personally, I think the, the, the way that Packet resolves that seems much more sensible. Look at the high level, then go down, then go down, then go down, and keep a tab of things that have particular problems with those and treat those specially and try and figure out those ones before figuring out the things that are less conflicting. So, converting from NuGet to Packet, have I, have I got some convertees already? <laughs> it's super, super simple, it's so simple. It's, I, it's literally six steps, and one of those is profit. So, um, yeah, first thing you do is just go and make a .packet directory in the, in the, the root of your solution. Download this packet bootstrapper exe that is like a tiny 37 kilobytes, I think was the last one, uh, executable. That's the only thing you need to check in for packet. That's the only thing. The bootstrapper will pull down whatever the latest version of packet is automatically and then do, do, do its magic. So I've just written a little bit of PowerShell there that will basically go and get the latest version of the bootstrapper for you. You can just run that inside of the .packet directory and that'll get the bootstrapper for you. Check those two things in, you're, you're, you're good to go then. So the next thing to go then is uh, run that bootstrapper. So that, this, that's what you typically put into your build automation pipeline would be calling the, the bootstrapper. And that's gonna go and get the actual full, you know, the, the heavy packet exe. And so yeah, you're all set up there then. And then the next thing to do is convert all of those NuGet dependencies to packet dependencies. So generating all of those packet dependency files. And uh, yeah, and that's simply one command here, just convert from NuGet. That, that's it. And I, I've not seen it fail yet. Apparently it can do for more kind of tricky scenarios, but I've not seen it happen yet. Um, and then just call the simplify command, which will go through and prune out all of the, all of the uh, dependencies that don't really need to be there because they're actually not referenced by anything. It will go and prune those out for you. That's another kind of cool feature of, uh, of running packet there because, I mean, like, you know, the, your projects sometimes have references in there that are not being used by anything. You've got tools like ReSharp, I can tell you, you know, is this referenced by anything else? But packet can uh, can do that same thing for you so that's kind of packet in a nutshell and then oh yeah profit as well and that's kind of packet in enough in a in a nutshell super easy to get set up with super easy to convert from new get very very clear in terms of how it works uh, and uh, yeah very clear in terms of you know which projects reference which dependencies I, I i'm more than happy to take questions by the way as well yeah this, I take it one of these commands goes through and modifies all your project files. Yeah, so the convert from NuGet right. uh, command will do that. So yeah. And does it create, for those different groups, does it create like aliases for different DLLs so you can have the same? Yes, it can do. It, yeah, like it, it can. It can. So you're talking about like where you might have conflicting different versions of the same uh, assembly across there. That's a good question. I'm not sure off the top of my head. I think it creates groups for those, but I'm not 100% on that. If you did this and you decided you wanted to go back, yeah, do that. yeah, it's, uh, like uh, get, <laughs> get, yeah, 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 get, get reset, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So make sure, make sure you, you know, make sure you're in, you're in a good state before you do this. There's yeah. No, you get restore from that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. So, uh, in terms of, uh, if you've got a solution, yeah, you've got you know multiple projects in it. 
Yeah. Um, and you've also got stuff coming from outside, like you get at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, is Packet just managing the stuff that's sort of coming from outside, or does it do anything to do with how other projects, the build results of other projects within your solution are, are sort of managed as well? So reading into what you're saying so maybe referencing something that is built somewhere else or is that what you mean or I feel like if you've got a solution and yeah. you've got you know 10 projects in it yep and and project number one uh and project 10 project 10 uses the um the, the output of project one uh, okay is that just part of the build so yeah so that would just be so packet wouldn't replace that. That's just a you know project reference there instead. So packet wouldn't replace any of that at all. That would that would still exist as it is. So MS Build handles that case of you know understanding which projects are dependent on which ones. So build the dependent projects first. Or, yeah, the projects that are dependent on first. Yeah. So yeah, packet doesn't replace that. Kind of more anything that's coming from outside of the solution. So anything from file, from NuGet, from GitHub, from MyGet, yeah. Uh, so you had the PowerShell for installing Packet. Yeah. But uh, I found it quite tricky to get working on Mac. OK. Um, have you tried that yet? Yeah, so we uh, we have uh, like the, the .NET clients build on Mac as well. So with Packet and with Fake and yeah, with everything there as well. I think it's broken right now though, so don't go and, tr <laughs> don't go and try it. It broke, so a little bit of background. Uh, we moved to the DNX tooling when that was out and had everything working with the DNX tooling when that was out. And then uh, .NET XE, they deprecated DNX, uh, you know, all of that stuff, DNVM, et cetera, et cetera. We had everything working with that, but as a consequence of bringing that in, uh, it broke. Um, it broke that stuff working cross-platform, which is weird, right? I mean, it's there for for cross-platform, but it broke it. But I think that was more of our own stuff, really, than anything else. Um, but yeah, we moved all of that over to the .NET stuff when the .NET XE came out, and then have been iterating with that. And now we're just so we have. I, I can show you afterwards, actually. But we have stuff that's. Uh, using MS Build and stuff that's using .NET XE. And the reason for doing that right now is that things are moving back to MS Build anyway. So, you know, we, we basically don't want to invest too much time in putting the stuff on .NET XE because we know it's going to come in back anyway. Yeah. Does Packet um, provide any packaging and publishing capabilities or you still need so you can, yeah, packet can package, yeah, packet can package stuff, yeah. So would yeah. it use the new spec file? Yes, yeah, 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 it uses the new spec file, yeah, yeah. So with the .NET Core stuff, are mm -hmm. there any fundamental changes to how packages are handled in that sort of... Um, yeah, so it's all project JSON references there. I mean, yeah, but they're, yeah. Just, they're going to, are they not doing that? Um, uh, I'm not sure what uh, today's blog post said on that. Um, <laughs> if you'd asked me last week, I probably could have told you, but I haven't read it this week, so I'm not sure exactly where that's going uh, right now. I know that things are moving. I, I, my understanding is that stuff is going back from Xproj back into CSProj, and there is going to be a project.xml that will replace project.json. Um, to do the dependence to do the dependency stuff, but I'm not sure on the complete state of things there right now. I haven't I haven't downloaded Visual Studio 2017 yet. Yeah, I'm gonna wait until after Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I might wait for the RTM. One of my colleagues has downloaded the uh, the, the one, and um, yeah, I read his tweets and decided I like Christmas. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so converting from NuGet to Packet. So that's kind of Packet in a nutshell. The, was there any other questions around uh, Packet stuff? Did you stop using the NuGet GUI basically after you yes. into the Yes. Yeah, you can say goodbye to the, to the NuGet GUI completely. If you did use it, yeah. you have to rerun. Uh, 
something to fix it? You don't even need to, you don't need to, um, it, they don't interfere with each other in that way. If you went in, you know, so if you have everything running on packet, then you can just forget NuGet. You just don't run any of it. Yeah. So the, the packet install stuff, packet restore, all of that, all of that jazz will sort out. That's basically what you deal with. But it feeds nicely into fake, which I'll like. I'll go on to and yeah. Um, so yeah, that's that's packet. So that's on on to fake. So I wanted to tell you a little bit of a story. Actually, I wanted to segue into a, into a story here around um, compiling projects and um, building large solutions. So I was working for a, a company in, in the UK, uh, which shall remain nameless, but um, this sort of, we were working on this large, like really large scale solution, like 300 projects in there. And each one of those projects had like countless number of dependencies in there. I, 300 projects in a solution. It, like Visual Studio just about works still, but I'll, I'll tell you some stories about that as well. So the problem with that is that if you were to run um, build from inside of Visual Studio, like that's, that's half your day gone, honestly. It was like, it, it was like, I can't remember what it was at the, at the end of it. It was about three hours, I think, to build it in Visual Studio. So dropping down to the command line, setting, you know, building across multiple processors, doing all of that stuff, got that down to an hour and 15 minutes on the command line. So that was kind of us just running on the, the standard issued machines. So this was obviously impacting our ability to release and do all of those things and push stuff out into stakeholder environments, et cetera, et cetera. This was using TFS and team build as well at the same time. Um, so it was decided that every developer was going to be issued with a server machine. And I think at that time it was some kind of Xeon processor, like eight cores and like 32 gig of RAM and, and all of that stuff. And that, that helped stuff a little bit and that brought it down to sort of 45 minutes. Like building on the command line, like um, on, on your machine. Anyway, it was kind of the, um, tweaking the paralyze, parallelization further and going through every single configuration option in, in MS build. Uh, managed to get that down to, I think it was about 13 minutes, but that was not building the entire project. That was only building certain critical components at time as well. Um, in the end, one of the, the reasons that that thing took so long was that um, we were on a, I think, if I remember correctly, we were on a 32-bit OS at the time, and uh, it was a secure environment, and we couldn't upgrade to, uh, we couldn't upgrade to a 64-bit OS. So that was that was part of the problem, I believe, yeah, at the time. But yeah, anyway, that was sorry a little segue into talking about fake, but that was that was a very very painful project, um, but it got delivered and it won some awards. So you know, it can work. Eventually. <laughs> um, so yeah, so talking about fake in F sharp make, I so wish this existed when that project uh, was around, or when I was working on that project, because yeah, it was uh, team foundation build, like MS build, custom MS build tasks, all of that stuff. This is like, uh, this was pre, you know, pre things like pre jQuery, pre like system web optimization, so none of that you know, compressing of JavaScript files. Now that we did all of that ourselves. We wrote the tooling to do all of that stuff ourselves. Um, but yeah, fake would have been awesome at that time, uh, simply because it's just way, way easier to use and configure and all of the helpers and all of the, yeah, all of the, the commands that are available. Um, sorry, all of the, the different options that you have available. But yeah, it's basically a build automation tool similar to make and rake uh, so you define stuff in F-sharp, which is why we're here tonight. And um, you can easily start using this without really knowing F-sharp. And it, to be honest, it's a really good way to, to get more up to speed with, with F-sharp, because you can start going off on some really cool, crazy tangents with how you integrate stuff into your pipeline, which I can show some of that stuff in a bit. 
main concepts really are there's a fake XE and that's the thing you run and that is going to do your build for you or it's going to call out to other tools and do build, builds for you. Uh, there's a targets. So this is where you specify all of the different types of uh, builds that you want to run. So maybe you want to build in release mode or maybe you want to build in release, uh, you want to build and you want to run tests or build, run test, run integration tests or build and package and push to NuGet. That's, that's, that's where you would specify that stuff in targets. File sets, being able to say, I want this bunch of uh, um, files here using like a glob pattern, but then I want to exclude these files here but then I want to add this file onto those as well. So file sets allow you to easily do that. And then star helpers. So there are just tons and tons of helpers already out there for pretty much all of the common things you generally want to do with building. And we'll, we'll talk about those in a sec. And it's so easy to install it with packet. So we just go and set this up in our packet dependencies. So specify our build group. So like I was saying before, you have these auxiliary projects that you might be using that you don't, they don't output anything, but they help within your project. So we've got a build group here, and then we're, we're just gonna um, specify fake there. And then we just run packet uh, install, and then we have fake package on our, on our machine. So the next thing we probably wanna do is have a, just a container project for all of our F sharp scripts that we're gonna write so that, um, you know, for our target files and other, f uh, other extension points. So go and set up that project. And then in our uh, target script, just reference the, the fake library that's in the packet package that we just downloaded and then open it and then we, we are ready to go. So the next thing that we'd wanna do inside of that, that script is to go and define some targets. So we can see here that we have a couple of targets here, test and build. So both of them just write something out to the console. They don't do anything right now. And then we've specified down the bottom here that test uh, has a dependency on build. So if we wanted to go to, to fake and say, uh, fake run the test target, it's gonna go and run the build target first, and then it's gonna run the test target. And then if we just run fake without any targets, it's just gonna run the build target for us by default. So the way that you would end up calling this with fake is you'd call fake XE and then pass it the name of the target that you want it to run. And you know that, that's all fine, that's all well and good. Um, but one of the things that's often useful to do is to set up like a batch script like this just in the root file or a PowerShell script or a bash script, whichever, whatever your flavor of uh, you know, command line scripting is. Uh, so this is kind of like a stripped down version of what we have in uh, the .NET projects. Um, so we can see how this ties in with packet here. So first of all, call that bootstrapper, then call packet restore to restore all our packages. And so if, there, if, there aren't, if there's nothing to restore, that's like super, super quick. And then we've just specified a default target in here. We could, we could not even have that, to be honest. And then we just specified pointing this to our targets F sharp script, and then just call fake at the bottom here. So this is just in the root of the solution. And then we just, we'll just call build dot, you know, bat file and, or maybe pass it a target build dot bat, you know, test. And then it's just gonna run packet, do all of the packet, packet stuff, and then run, and then run fake for us super, super simple and hopefully easy to understand. So the, f the file set stuff that I was talking about previously uh, allows you to do this kind of stuff. So bang, bang, I wanna uh, reference, uh, I wanna get all of the CS proj files in source app, any directories under source app. And then I wanna include this F sharp project, but then I wanna exclude this, uh, this one here so yeah, plus, plus, minus, minus, hopefully pretty obvious stuff. And then we've just got our build app target here, which is gonna call MS build release. So this is, uh, like I was saying previously, this is like one of those helpers here. So this helper here um, is gonna build stuff in release mode, and it already knows where to find MS build XE, it already knows how to, to, to determine all of that for you. And then we're just gonna log anything out to the, to the console here as well. Oh, and it's going to call. It's going to call this for all of these 
project, uh, all of these uh, uh, projects here. Obviously, we could have just referenced the solution file and built that entire solution if we wanted to as well. But that's kind of includes and excludes for you. And then, as I said before, heaps and heaps of helpers. So I, I had to get that in there because uh, we're in Australia. So. Um, yeah, heaps of helpers. So yeah, one, those for the file system, so those file sets. And then there's loads and loads of shortcuts for things like doing file.exists, you know, does, uh, go and create this directory, all of, the, all of the stuff you usually want to do when you're trying to figure out where things are on the file system. There's, um, you know, functions like composable functions for doing all of those things. Um, being able to call out to msbuild and .NET XE, there are helpers for doing that already. So Trying to find out where .NET XE is cross-platform is is a, is fun. It's fun, I, I, and the DNX stuff as well. To be honest, is yeah, it's really fun. Um, so just use the helper. You know, it's like it's done for you. Don't need to figure out where it is. Um, yeah, any testing frameworks you're using pretty much have helpers for them as well. So just simply call the helper and then pass it the configuration that you want and where the output of the, you know, the test XML uh, output needs to go. And then bunch, a bunch of integrations here as well. So when, you know, the build is finished, post the Slack. There's already a helper to do that. Um, one's to Team City as well. One's to start up and stop the Azure emulator. So if you're running, developing stuff for Azure locally, there's already a helper to do that for you as well. So pretty much nearly everything that you can think of as a helper for it. And if it doesn't have a helper for it, it's so easy to extend it with fake. And I'll, I'll show you some examples of that now. So putting this all together and looking at what we have um, in, in the .NET clients is kind of useful to see some real world examples of this. Like, you know, you I kind of talk through the simple high level of packet and fake, but like, you know, how are we actually using this at Elastic and what are we doing with this? So this is all on GitHub already. You can go and download the Elastic stuff and go and pull it all out. It's all under Apache 2. So if you want to take it and use it in your own projects, you know, it's, it's, it's open source. So you can, you can go and do that. But let's kind of, um, let's kind of uh, go and have a look at those things. So I'm just going to flip through and duplicate this one. Oh, that's not big enough, is it? Let's make this a bit bigger. Anyone know the shortcut for increasing? Ah, we can do it with the, uh, yeah. Wee. So I just thought I'd start on the targets uh, script first. So we have a bunch of so we reference, we, we split our build out into a bunch of different F sharp scripts. So we've got a script that does like a wraps tooling that we need to use, for example, or, um, you know, maybe finds paths to particular things that might be in one F sharp script. And then we've got another one here to sort out versioning of things. So going and updating all the assembly infos to bump the version of those when we release a new version, testing stuff there, obviously. It's, it's, obvious. Uh, signing the assemblies as well. Um, so obviously MS build can do that. You specify the key. That's all good. Uh, but we check to make sure that things are signed correctly as well. It's happened before um, that things, you know, things have been built and then they've not been signed correctly. So we just verify that stuff is actually what we think it is. Uh, building them also running, we generate documentation for the clients based on tests. So we have some stuff that uh, we use Roslyn to basically go through tests and pull out particular elements of those test files and generate ASCII doc files from those. And then those ASCII doc files actually go to another central process that generates the HTML uh, and all the documentation you see for the clients online. So that's what the documentation stuff does. We profile and benchmark the clients as well. So we got some stuff that we call out to there as well. So we just have a bunch of different targets here. And uh, it's kind of not very interesting to kind of look through like this, but um, bear with me. Um, so yeah, a bunch of different ones. And then down the bottom here, we have all of the dependencies uh, here for each of the different uh, targets here. So you can see we've got quite a few different dependencies here. 
<laughs> ah, yeah, sorry. Yeah, that I, I should I should say actually. Um, I really love the the Fira code font. So if and if if no one else has seen this before, uh, I'm just using the Fira code font here. So uh, it gives you some really nice ligatures here for um, for particularly for programming languages. So yeah, all all this here is just a pipe backwards operator. So if I yes yeah, do this and then uh, specify the pipe, it just gives me the nice little triangle ligature there. It looks really cool for F sharp. It's cool for C sharp as well. Fire code, F I R A C O D E. So yeah, just go and install the fonts there, and you can use those in in Visual Studio, uh, Visual Studio Code, any of the editors. Emoji yeah, I I love it. Emoji Visual Studio. Yeah, yeah, it, it has. I think it has some things that look very similar to emojis in there as well. Um, but yeah, sorry, I should have I should have explained that. Um, yeah, so we just pass a function into the target, and that function's going to run when that target gets called. I should have also told you that as well. So we can see these are calling out to various different things here. Uh, let, let's go and have a look and see what that is. So this is in this build script here. So we've got a few different static methods here on, on this build type. So a few different things we do. So cleaning all of the bin in obj folders, super easy to do. Just call the clean directory. Uh, you just call this on, on those directories. We actually build everything to a separate out build output folder because that's where we do all the packaging and where we, where we do all, all of that kind of tempor temporary stuff. So we just specify that, that there. Uh, so quick compiling. We do some other things as well. When we, when we release, um, Often it can be useful if you, um, you know, if you if you want to be able to uh, kind of go to source, then there's a pretty cool tool called Git Link, which can basically uh, insert into the PDB file. It can insert into that PDB file references to where those files can be found on GitHub. So we we run Git Link there to modify the PDBs when we send those out. So if you if you reflect F12 on, on a particular piece, then you can... Visual Studio will actually go to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It still says my local path file if you, in, the, in all the debug messages, which, uh, you know, is kind of fun, you know, but um, yeah, Git link is, is useful for that. So that's just a tool here that we've, that we've wrapped up in another, in another script here. So this is quite an interesting script to look at. We have a bunch of different things for different projects that we target. So as I said earlier, net 4.5, 4.6, and net standard 1.3. And the two different projects that we do end up building, nest and elasticsearch.net. <coughs> then our private test project, which we also need to build to, in order to pass out to the test tooling. And yeah, it's kind of going, going down here, uh, ways of being able to try and find those particular projects based on where we are in the, the file hierarchy. Um, but I think this is, this is quite kind of interesting to look at. So where I was talking about before, you know, there's loads and loads of helpers for doing all the useful stuff. If there isn't a helper for the thing that you need to do, then it's super, super easy to write something. So we've got this tooling module here, and uh, we have a couple of different uh, tools in here. So one of the things we do is we pop up toast on the, uh, operating system, and there's an easy Node.js package to go and do that. So we have some uh, we have some uh, some tooling in here for npm and and Node here to reference those. So build tooling there. We also use all of the JetBrains like the profiler and like timeline memory profiler to memory profile the the um, clients as well to make sure we not messing things up as we release new versions. And again, simply we've wrapped, we've wrapped those here as well. We've got the profiler tooling here. If it doesn't exist locally, go and download it, unzip it, and then reference that stuff. So we can then easily run that profiler tooling. And then we just wrap the execution of, you know, calling those particular, um, calling those particular executables here and passing them the arguments there. So integrating JetBrains, tooling, super, super easy to do. It's like, it's literally this. And then we'll just, 
we'll call it in another uh, in another script. So if we go to profiling profiling script here, here's our profiler. So run run the trace profiler, grab the snapshots, use uh, use those um, use the snapshots to uh, sorry pull out a an XML snapshot from the actual profiled uh, file. So the, the, there's like a profiled file. You can give you all of the in-depth stuff that gets read by the tooling. You can open that up and like navigate down and through. But that's kind of not useful for stuff like Team City and that. So you can do the snapshot stats and, and the reporter, and you can get something more meaningful out to integrate with Team City. So like an XML file and how long each individual thing takes. So we just call all those different tools here, essentially. And then within the same uh, project, we also do benchmarking as well. So we can call that compiled, uh, um, it's actually uh, uh, the DLL, test, yeah, test DLL. We can call it in a different way here. And then we use the benchmark.net stuff there as well to benchmark, you know, to get some real fine grain um, understanding of like allocation of bytes, you know, like. Uh, you know GC you know all of the GC events there as well how long things are taking you know where, where the serialization is, is there as well um, but yeah how long the serialization is taken so we can easily just go and run benchmarking there as well so we've just wrapped wrap that stuff up there as well um, so how does this integrate with MS build and how much does it depend on the CS project and those kind of things so for building actual projects, obviously there is no better tool than MS Build to do that. So Fake is not trying to replace any of that tooling. Fake is simply a way of you being able to automate all of that tooling across, you know, uh, within within your project. So it still calls out to MS Build to do the actual uh, building, but you can see like there's loads of other stuff that we do which you know doesn't depend on MS build it depends on other tooling and if there isn't any other tooling for it or you know then we can we can write our own stuff for that as well so for example have a, having a look at the versioning here as well just to to go and update all of the um, assembly infos there there's a tool for that zero to nine uh, that can do that for you but it's such a common thing to do you can do it on the CI server obviously as well but we can just uh, when we when we run like a release to build the actual packages for Nest, we can just run the versioning target as well, and it'll, it's going to go and update all of that stuff for you. Um, and how does this fit into the sort of usual developer F5 workflow? Are they doing that most of the time, and then occasionally running this like a gated check-in or something like that? So I can still I can still go and run F6 and build build this project here. So it doesn't interfere with any of that stuff. I can still run, you know, build this, run this, run the tests, use ReSharper, use whatever tooling that I want to do. That doesn't affect my like day-to-day -day development workflow. But let's say, uh, you know, right now, okay, I've put some new stuff in and I need to release a new version of the clients. That's super, super easy to e easy to do. I need to bump the font on here as well, don't I? It's really small. Um, Um, let me see, see if I can make this bigger. I reckon it probably works as well. What do you reckon? Let's, let's give it a try. Oh, look at that. As if by magic. Uh, yeah, so we can just run that build batch file. And then if I want to go and run the, uh, you know, I want to go and run the integration test for this to so spin up Elasticsearch clusters, fire a bunch of stuff at it, make sure that's all working and run that against the particular version of Elasticsearch as well. And it'll go and pull down the zip of Elasticsearch, unzip it to a particular file, set up Elasticsearch ready to go, install all the plugins that are needed for all the things that we need to test. That's all automated uh, here as well. So I can just go and run this, and this is going to be this is using fake here and using packet. So it's going to check to see if there's a new version of packet exe. So restore the packets, and then we're just watching build Nirvana now. So 
So we're just going to run through and build all the projects and then we'll see that we get into running integration tests and you'll see all... Oh, <laughs> it was red earlier, so yeah, I just tweaked the colors in the, in the, com in the command console, yeah. So yeah, this is just uh, started running these integration tests now and uh, there's 800 of them. We probably don't want to sit here and watch them all, um, but this is kind of, you know, this is kind of an easy, easy workflow to get running with. So I already have Elasticsearch 5 already unzipped here, so it hasn't gone and downloaded it, but it would have done if you'd have, if you, you know, clone this project and just run build bat, it would do all of those things for you. And that's all, that's pretty much all fake and all packet running that. So yeah, it's gonna start getting noisy. We're just gonna kill that off there and, and you know, we can go and run, um, we can just go and run, uh, unit tests here as well as part of a normal build and you know it's going to go and do some other stuff Oy! it's going to get confused now yeah but yeah <laughs> it's getting confused because i've stopped it midway through and it's uh yeah i'm going to continue doing stuff but that that is fake in a nutshell any sort of questions on that so the CI server just runs fake on there with different commands and uh, and different different outputs. So targeting different versions of Elasticsearch is just a, a change to the version there. So you try and get all of your brains out of the CI server into the scripts. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. Other than the stuff that the the CI server is good for, which is like you know things like keeping logs of which tests have passed and which ones have failed. You know, maybe keeping artifacts around as well, like. Um, you know, maybe temporary uh, files that we might need. So like the uh, profiling stats and benchmarking stats, those will all be in CI. But yeah, most of it is out of there and, and in here as well. Oh, the other thing I should have said as well is that when stuff runs on the integration server, we just have another uh, F-sharp uh, target here that runs a canary build and then just publishes that to MyGet. So, you know, people wanting, waiting for like a, a critical bug fix that isn't in a NuGet version yet because we're not ready to push it. They could just go and reference that, that CI uh, build on MyGet instead, which will, may have the fix in there. Um, but that's all uh, kind of automated with, with fake for doing that as well. Yeah, that's, that is all I have. Thank you very much for attending. And there's a couple of links there for packet and fake and for the GitHub if you want to go and have a look in more detail. Thank you very much. <laughs>